collections of the art museums in Israel, and it's a not-for-profit organization which raises funds for educational program in Israeli museums of art. So do sign up to our database to get uh, updates about our programs. And also you can follow up on Instagram at Bafami underscore. We will now move on to the conversation and I'm going to be in conversation with Ralph Rugoff, the director of the Hayward Gallery in a moment. We'll be talking all together for about 50 minutes. Um, at the end of our conversation, I'll also be looking at questions and inviting questions from the audience. So if you're joining us on Zoom, have a look at the bottom of your screen at the Q&A button and you can press that button type in your question, you can type it in at any point, I'll be coming to that towards the end of our conversation. So now, without further ado, let me introduce Ralph Rugoff. Um, Ralph is originally from New York City, and in 2006, he became the director of the Hayward Gallery in London. Over the years, he's curated excellent shows at the Hayward, including, including most recently exhibitions on Kada Atia, Andreas Goski, and Infinite Mix in 2016. Ralph was also in 2019 the curator of the Venice Art Biennale. And I'll come back to that very point in a minute, but I'm now going to invite Ralph to join me on our digital stage. So Ralph, if you can come in, great. Welcome, good evening. Ralph, I think you need to unmute as well. We can now see you. Yes, if you can also unmute yourself, um, it'll, be, it'll be better for our conversation. Fabulous. Yeah, well, <laughs> Welcome. Just... All right. Good. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining us on, on the, and joining me for this conversation, Ralph. As I mentioned when I introduced you, um, in 2019, you were the curator of the Venice Art Biennale, and you chose uh, an arresting theme. Uh, the theme you chose was may you live in interesting time. Now, I don't know if you have a crystal ball, uh, but I guess you couldn't have foreseen how interesting the times were going to become. I wondered if you could tell us what you had in mind, what was your ambition for the Biennale with this theme, and now reflecting on it, uh, as we are indeed living through interesting time, you know, what are your, your takeaways? Yes, yeah, so I think you have to be very careful about the titles you choose for exhibitions in case. <laughs> um, but you know, in, when I was appointed, it was the end of 2017. So we'd already had Brexit. We'd already seen Trump elected in the United States. Um, we'd seen uh, swings towards authoritarian governments in several countries in Europe. There was a real sense that something a lot of us had taken for granted, a vision of kind of um, international cooperation among democracies uh, and the culture that that brings was suddenly um, something we couldn't take for granted anymore. And um, we saw a lot of populist anger and uprising. And uh, so I think it was evident then that things were definitely gonna be changing. We also knew of course that we'd reached a tipping point with climate change um, and that no one was really taking any serious action about it and that things were gonna to begin to accelerate in terms of the effects of global warming, in terms of extreme weather, fires, droughts, uh, and that we were gonna be seeing all the impact of that and, and climate refugees uh, exacerbating 
all the other problems in the world. So I don't think you really needed a crystal ball. I mean, I, I think I missed the pandemic, but I think, I think you could have a pretty good sense that uh, we were going through an interesting time. And I think, you know, this phrase, may you live in interesting times, was something I'd grown up believing was an ancient Chinese curse because it had been referred uh, that way by people ranging from Robert Kennedy to Hillary Clinton to uh, Albert Camus. It was great writers in the West constantly referred to this ancient Chinese curse and it turns out to be a complete myth. There, there is no uh, ancient Chinese expression, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> It seems to have been fabricated by a British member of parliament in the early part of the 20th century. And it was one of his descendants who gave a speech, also a member of parliament in 1936, warning about the rise of fascism in Germany. Um, and he used this expression uh, in that context. So I thought for me, in a world that was becoming increasingly right. dominated by fake news and also by this haunting specter of authoritarianism, not only in these European countries and the United States, obviously in places like Russia and China, uh, and then in Brazil, um, it seemed like a title that could be resonant in different ways, but my interest also though was really to highlight why art is interesting in any time. And that is because of its complexity, its ability to deal with ambiguity, with layers of meaning, all the things that populist politicians don't like to deal with. And that a lot of the news media that we read every day doesn't like to deal with. I mean, Artists tend to look at subjects from multiple perspectives. And I'm very frustrated reading the newspapers I read every day now because they're talking about the same things over and over again in the same way. And uh, I really uh, find I'm not actually getting much information anymore. I'm getting you know things that are hitting my uh, nerves in different ways and making me anxious or angry. But it's really not, not uh, it's the same point of view over and over again. And I think one mm -hmm. of the great things that I, I really enjoy in art is that artists look at things in different ways. And so in the Biennale, every artist got to show two different types of work that they make. And there are two main buildings in the Biennale and in one building, they would show something and in the other building, they would show something that hopefully was completely different. I mean, in about half the cases, you would never have guessed it was the same artist making that work. And so that was a way to try to highlight this capacity of art to uh, allow us to see things in different ways. And I think that's invaluable and something we need now more than ever. Absolutely. I think, I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, it could equally be redone and, and reviewed today. Um, I think we've all gone through a lot of experiences that is changing, that are changing our outlook in, in, on the world. And I, and I guess the, the exhibition that we're going to come to talk about um, among the trees does that as well, powerfully. Well, you know, I think the thing with Among the Trees, I mean, I wanted to make an exhibition that would somehow call attention to our impact on our physical environment. But I really did not want to make a doom and gloom global warming exhibition because I feel we get that information already. Uh, and that's, you know, from, from news media. Um, and I also wanted to make a an exhibition that respects the way artists think. And it's not trying to use art as 
a way to illustrate that there's a problem in the world and we should do something about it. I didn't think that's really arts. That's not its best use. And I've been waiting for an occasion to do this kind of show. And I, I decided that the 50th anniversary of Earth Day was a good occasion. And it turns out a lot of other people thought so too, because there's been a, a raft of earth and wood and forest and plant related shows this year. There was a mushroom show at Somerset House and Camden Art Center just opened a botany show and uh, Gropius Bau and Berlin did a some kind of earth show and the Serpentine has an exhibition now with two designers exploring wood. So it's, I'm really happy to see that, uh, and the Icon Gallery actually also did something in Birmingham um, my dream was that somehow a hundred galleries around the world, we'd all be doing something, but we may have to do that again <laughs> soon enough. Well, what I should say is that Among the Trees is the current show at the Hayward and it's open until the end of October, the 31st of October. I really encourage everyone to try and go see it if, if you're in London. If you're not in London, we're going to have a glimpse of the exhibition as we walk through it with Ralph. But um, I'd say it was, I was really surprised by the exhibition. I, I, I'd admit I'm, I'm more of a city person. Um, and so I went to see the exhibition because the Hayward Gallery was one of the first museums and gallery to reopen after lockdown. We'd been starved of culture and it was such a pleasure to go inside. So I just gave it a go. And I was really swept off my feet uh, in, in the exhibition. First of all, transplanted into a dreamlike wor world. Um, it was really what I needed. And I still think it's what people need today, that reconnection with nature. So um, I know that you've, you've got a, a few images um, to show us and we can um, yeah, start that. looking. Um, while you do that, I'd say that in the first sequence of room, my, my favorites are uh, Robert Longo's drawing untitled and um, also Eva Jospin's Cardboard Forest and the ma massive video installation by AJ Lisa Tila. Um, so tell us a bit more about what you were trying to do, how you set out the exhibition, um, what you're trying to provoke as, as visitors come in and are, encounter these works. Mm. Well, I mean, the exhibition traces a kind of 50 year history of contemporary artists making work about trees. And it's interesting, sometime in the mid to late 1960s, contemporary artists started making really wonderful, provocative works about trees. And this included artists like Giuseppe Pannoni. Uh, Christo did several wrap trees that were, we didn't have any exhibition, but really powerful works. And, um, Robert Smithson made a number of works with trees. These were really pioneering artists who were really making new types of work, really breaking new ground. And this was a first. The tree had not really been the subject of advanced pioneering art in previous decades or even previous centuries. In fact, trees, you would rarely ever find a sculpture of a tree. Uh, a painter, occasionally in the history of art, you get a tree that's the subject of a painting. But most of the time, trees were background material. And I think what happened in the 60s and why trees suddenly became a subject that artists thought about really related to the emergence of the environmental movement in the 1960s and the idea that um, industrial societies were having a really serious negative impact on the natural world. And this meant that trees could take on a different set of meanings and could be explored uh, in different ways. And over time, that interest in trees has led artists down a lot of different 
avenues of approach. And, and one of them, before we get to the pieces you mentioned, Alice, is this uh, on the left of the screen, it's a photograph by uh, Thomas Struth from his series called Paradise, where he went around to different jungles and rainforests in the world and took photographs. And he said something really interesting that he wanted to make pictures where there was so much information um, that he couldn't really make sense out of it. And you had to suspend your analytical thinking. So there's no foreground and background. There's no central subject. You're just in the woods, basically. Um, and it's that idea that then maybe your mind and your eye wanders in a different kind of way. And uh, this is something that involves a different type of looking than the way we normally look at things. And I think this is one thing that artists get from trees. And um, we're gonna zoom in here on this Robert Longo charcoal drawing, uh, Sleepy Hollow. Yes. Which is about three, a little over three and a half meters wide to give you a sense of how large this is. Beautifully rendered. And again, it's like a, an image of uh, nerve pathways in the brain. I mean, um, Gabriel Rosco, the wonderful artist who wasn't in this show, once compared the way artists think to the structure of trees. That this kind of nonlinear thought process where you start with one idea, but then it branches into something else. And then there are other options you explore and at the same time, roots are going down in a different direction. So I think that might also have some of the attraction uh, for artists in looking at this structure. But Longo titled a couple of paintings in his tree series after abstract expressionist painters like Jackson Pollock and Joan Mitchell. So I think there's also a sense of that using the tree to an image of something real in the world, but that invites us to scan a field in the same way that those painters did with their works. Uh, where again, they decentered the idea of a composition. There was no central focus. Uh, meaning was all over the canvas potentially. And you were allowed to your eyes became nomadic and they never really come to rest on any one point. And that experience, which is kind of destabilizes the way we normally think we're supposed to look at pictures uh, where there's a foreground and a background and artists use effects of lighting to concentrate your attention on one particular area. This is a really different way of um, looking. And it's, it is. And it is quite surprising uh, because you mentioned it's a charcoal drawing, but uh, as you arrive, you, you'd think it's it's a photograph. Um, and, but it has this this dreamy quality, and it really sets a tone for for the exhibition. I mean, it's interesting because charcoal, right, is made from um, uh, fossilized trees, basically, right? I think. And of course, it's a work on paper. So this is a work made from the materials of, of yes. trees. And that's also the same with this next work by Eva Jospin, uh, the Forêt Palatine. And again, to give you a sense of how high this work is, the wall that you see behind it is just over six meters high. So this is well over five and a half meters high. This very dense wood with a kind of shallow depth to it. And I'll zoom in on this. Uh, and this also is made from the material that comes from trees. It's made from cardboard boxes. And if you look closely, especially on the left side, it's probably more evident. You'll see the corrugated uh, surface of the cardboard you know, that's sandwiched in between the two solid pieces. These are packing uh, boxes. And Eva uses a scalpel and a kind of small, precise kind of uh, electric saw to carve out 
these forms of trees. And it's interesting, she says that for her, her forest is entirely cerebral. That it really has as much to do with the history of images, but also the history of literature. And like the works of Longo and Struth, which invite you to kind of have this wandering experience of looking, I think her work really plays with this idea, which we often experience as a fear, but sometimes as a desire to get lost. You know, and that it's inviting this sense of uh, this forest that's too complex to comprehend in a way that overwhelms you um, with its detail as well as its size. And it plays with our perception because it takes a little while uh, staring at it from up close to understand what's going on with this piece. And then you, you're mesmerized and you look at it more and more. It's, uh, it's, it's really engrossing. And then, you know, that, that sort of playfulness of, you know, start, this is a material that started as a tree that became a cardboard box and that's becoming a forest again. Um, it is, it's really, you know, um, it makes you think and stop about, and stop to think about the life cycle of these objects and what we're doing to these trees, how we're transforming them. Yeah, there's a sense in a few works on this show of this re-transformation of an industrial product made from trees yes. back into a source material. Um, and yeah, Ava's piece, I think, you know, it's, it works, it's almost like a giant painting in some ways, but then it's got this very physical aspect. Um, and when people realize that it's made of cardboard, as you were saying, people really want to actually touch it. Um, yes. <laughs> there's a sense that you can't quite believe what you're, you're looking at. Um, and that's a quality of works of art that I adore. And uh, I think several works have that in the exhibition. We'll come to some later on. Um, yes. At least I think you also mentioned this piece by Asia. Yes. So that's a tacit uh, This piece, uh, this video projection yes. behind Rodney Graham's lovely upside down tree um, by Asia Lisa Atta, wonderful artist and filmmaker from Finland. And if you look on the left side of the screen, you'll see this small figure in a blue coat, which gives you some sense of the size of this tree, which is an 11 meter tree and it's reproduced in the gallery at actual scale. But of course, very few galleries have 11 meter high ceilings. So the only way the artist <laughs> can do that is by putting it on its side. And the other thing that's, uh, is she realizes the only way she could create a portrait of a tree was to turn the camera sideways and photograph the tree in sections going up the tree using a, a scissor lift. Because if you just stand back from a tree, you have to stand so far back with the camera in order to get the whole tree in the frame that then it's a landscape at that point. It's no longer a portrait of a tree. And she, one of the artists, I think key points of interest was this notion that our technology for making pictures is so anthropomorphic, it's based on capturing our image and that it's completely unable to capture the image of a tree and to show you a, a tree in a gallery because our architecture isn't designed for that either. And to bring up this question of, do we actually exist in kind of separate space-time environments where there's a human environment, but that's not the only one, uh, a human space-time. Um, and one lovely thing about this piece that I like is because she filmed the different sections of the tree, one after the other, um, they're not in sync. I mean, you're not looking at one tree in one moment in time. And so as the leaves are moving in the wind and there's a lot of wind on the day she shot, you get this sense of like watching an, 
a, a sea, the waves in the sea that aren't in sync anymore. They're all moving to slightly different rhythms at different moments. Uh, and it's quite mesmerizing. It is. And, and I spent quite a bit of time, like the, the people in, the, in, in your ph ph photograph, um, sat and just immersing myself into, into the space, looking at that enormous tree. And you reach a very contemplative stage and you know you start to slow down and live at the pace of the of the trees um so that that and that's really what i you know what i needed i guess um, and it's it's unusual to to get that in our very very busy lives no i was really uh, it was unexpected for me in a way to find out that this show had this kind of therapeutic quality to it but it, it by talking to a lot of people who've come, it seems that that's the case. I mean, I knew I wanted to make the entrance very much like you were entering a forest with uh, putting walls in places so you couldn't see everything at once and having all these images about this complex branching structure and giving people an invitation in a way to have this experience about getting lost and, and in this case, getting immersed in this experience, it is kind of an oceanic experience. It's that sense of mm. allowing yourself to drift with this phenomena that you're looking at. Yes, and then as you progress in the exhibition, the, the, the pace changes and you've included a number of pieces that are a bit harder hitting um, in the following sections. And I'm thinking here about the Steve McQueen lynching tree, about the William Kentridge piece as well, um, and also Jeff Wall's photograph of the massive Israeli prison in the Negev desert. Um, now, all of these are unsettling. I mean, they're at first sight, at first glance, they're beautiful, but then you pay attention and we're, we're looking at the, the Steve McQueen um, lynching tree there and, and you have to read the label and then you look at this tree in a completely different way and it stops you in your tracks. Tell us a bit more about these works and about how and what you intended to do in including these images in, in the narrative of the exhibition? Well, you know, if the first section of the exhibition was really looking at the complex architecture of trees and what we can get out of that and what it can tell us about our own ways of looking, this section of the exhibition was really looking at the ways in which human culture and tree culture are intertwined and one way that happens is just the way that trees are used by humans um, and also are witnesses to human history because of course they outlive us. So trees become, uh, you have trees left over in this case from the Civil War uh, and in the black and white photos here by Sally Mann, uh, they were taken uh, in the site of battlefields in the American South uh, battlefields from the Civil War. And you get this strange mix of knowing this incredible, awful violence occurred around these things. And yet there's also this kind of innocent beauty. And the same is very much true of this uh, light box photograph by Steve McQueen, um, which was a tree he came across while he was scouting locations for his film, 12 Years a Slave. And this was a tree outside of the city of New Orleans, which had historically been used uh, to lynch both uh, black American slaves and black Americans after slavery had ended. Uh, so it was a tree with a, attached to this horrible history of, of violence um, and I think he 
made this image to have that effect where it looks, you know, just like a nice image of a tree in the woods. And, and then you, then you have to realize when you read the wallet label and it's called the lynching tree, that um, appearances can be deceiving. And I think that's a theme that also comes up in different ways throughout the exhibition. Uh, let's see on the right, here's this wonderful drawing by William Kentridge who's made many, many drawings of trees often on uh, these pages of old encyclopedias. And uh, I mean, it's fascinating to me. I mean, I think it was about 25 years ago, I was in Amsterdam in a little gallery and they had a show of tree drawings and paintings of trees. And that was the first time I, I really came across this subject. And I started noticing every time I saw tree works after that. And it, it really does seem like just about half the artists in the world have spent some time making works about trees. And Kentridge, uh, one of the subjects he's interested in is in South Africa, the question of who's a native and who's authentic became quite important. And in, in trees, many of the so-called native trees were actually imported by the colonialist mining companies and, and other businesses from Europe who wanted to create some landscape that reminded them of where they were from. And the sense of what is a, a local tree versus what is the tree uh, that has adapted to the environment is, is one of the subjects that comes up in some of his explorations of trees. And then here's this work by Jeff Wall uh, taken in an olive grove in Israel with the Bedouin workers who are sleeping next to the olive grove because they will literally begin work uh, probably about five minutes after this photograph was taken, which was about five in the morning. And in the background, which is probably why Jeff Walt chose this particular orchard, you see what is, I think, the largest maximum security prison in Israel. You can barely make it out uh, on your screen, but it, it's a little easier to see. And again, yeah. you hear trees obviously are an important part of economies. Uh, we depend on them for food. Um, They've been cultivated by humans for thousands of years. And so, the, I mean, it, it's almost impossible to imagine the rise of human civilization as we know it without trees. I mean, trees provided us with wood to make fires, to cook food, to build shelters, to make boats, to make furniture, to make tools. Our culture is you know, we have uh, lots of expressions in the English language about taking root or branching out that draw on this association, very long association with trees. And so uh, quite a few works in this section were looking at that intersection of human culture and what I have to call tree culture, because I think trees actually have something like a culture. Um, I think thinking of them as nature something without culture uh, is a mistake. So, yeah. And, and I think also, you know, I'm reminded what you, of what you said, you know, the, the, the different timelines of, you know, trees exist for, for very long. And I guess as we move to the next section of the exhibition, what you mentioned, uh, this different time space of, of trees. We've got, there are two photographs of uh, Rachel Sussman, um, one of an underground forest, um, and then one of a tree, which is 10,000 years old. This is the underground forest. I mean, tell us more about this because it's just, it, it blows my mind. Well, Rachel Sussman, uh, it's a young artist in New York who for about 10 years has been doing this fascinating project called The Oldest Living Things on Earth, where she's taking photographs of 
exactly that. And uh, a number of things she's photographed have been old trees. And this is a phenomenon I had no, never come across, but was fascinated by in sub-Saharan Africa, in areas where there are constant fires, um, for, forests have begun to grow underground. So what you're looking at in this photograph, which looks like a small shrub, these are actually the tops of trees, uh, most of which exist under the, under the earth. Um, and this one, if you notice at the bottom, it says deceased, um, because after she photographed it, she discovered that uh, they were building a road in this area. So they dug up this underground forest. And here's another image of Rachel's of a 9,500 year old spruce tree in Sweden. And these ancient trees, and you really have to think, okay, what was happening with human beings 9,500 years ago? <laughs> 7,500 BC, not much. <laughs> um, this tree, that's when this tree was, was a seedling. Um, and one of the interesting things here is that these trees usually grow horizontally. Um, and in the last mm. 50 years, this tree has started to grow vertically because of global warming. It's, you know, it's fascinating how it, it, the exhibition constantly plays on our perception, on, on you know, just shifts our, our position. So how, how do you respond to, to a tree which bears witness to 10,000 years of human life and, and actually now is still evolving with yes. climate change, it's reflecting that. Yes, this it's- uh, I'll live all of us. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I hope so. Um, I hope, I certainly hope so. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of, of the, the time ticking. I, I wanted to go to, I guess, the second floor. And uh, there's some pretty, uh, there's trees at scale. Uh, actually, let's, let's stay well, on, on these pieces. Let's stay on these pieces. Right. Um, well. So these are Hugh Aiden. Zelig and Kazuo uh, Kadenonga, uh, wood oh, number five, because they are, when talking about changing our perception, it takes um, a lot of careful looking at these pieces to realize what's going on. Um, in the case of Hugh Zayden Zelig, which we're looking at, those two logs, one has been covered in feathers. And the other piece, a huge tree trunk has been sliced in very thin slices and then put back in a tree trunk. So this is artists uh, taking a piece of nature and playing with it and making it again what it was, except that it's not what it originally was. It's, yeah, it's quite unsettling. No, it's very interesting. I mean, I think there's a lot of work in the show, one that plays with the fact that trees undergo so many kinds of transformations. I mean, they change in the seasons, they change in their growth cycles, but we also make so many materials out of them. Um, but here in this idea of camouflaging a tree, and it's the upper log, which you can see is, is covered with these uh, they're actually uh, adolescent peacock feathers. And, um, but the male peacock, you know, the female peacock doesn't have the bright colors. So it's, that's why it's this woody color. Um, and I think to some extent, one of the things that happens, I mean, besides just the, that thrill of discovery and looking at the incredible artifice that, uh, that fooled you, um, is one, we're always being reminded that appearances are deceiving, I think, in art. And here it's also pulling the rug out from under our idea that this is a natural object when we see a log. Um, and I think questioning that idea when we see something that we think of as a tree 
and assuming that it has nothing to do with human culture. It's existing outside of our influence. We all know now, you know, we talk about living in the Anthropocene, uh, this era when everything on earth is touched by human industry, uh, our chemicals, our uh, behaviors, our economies, that nature doesn't really exist outside of, uh, there is no natural world in the, mm -hmm. in the sense of something that exists outside of us. Now here, is this wonderful piece by Kazu Karanaga, a Japanese artist who's now in his 70s, whose family actually owned a lumber mill. And he would choose the cedar logs from the forest to make these works out of. And this is a work that's over four meters long, where he took the trunk of a cedar tree and he used a saw, a type of uh, table saw that they use for making plywood veneer. And he cut this log into about a thousand thin slices. Um, I mean, these are slices that are like wax paper thin. And then he reassembled them, gluing them together. And the glue, of course, is changed by the moisture in the air and the climate. And so you see, uh, yeah, the sense of like this pile of papers. But again, when you look at this piece, it just looks like a gorgeous, you know, cedar trunk. Uh, and it's only when you get closer, you realize that it's completely artificial. Um, it, it's a, and it's a work of beauty. Uh, the aesthetic uh, impact is, is enormous. Um, but again, it's one where you spend a lot of time figuring out what is going on. Yeah, I mean, so ingenious to just come up with that idea, yes. even, you know, and to make something that looks so solid and heavy, and yet also give it this feeling of lightness, because you know that each single sheet is, you know, this feels like you could flip through this, like you were through looking at the pages of a book. Um, Alice, I know you were also interested in this piece. Yes. Um, I think again the scale. So we've seen those, uh, you know, the the rondos, charcoal drawing with those tentacle-like branches, and and this is almost it's a sculpture. It's an olive tree at scale. Um, it's it's quite arresting. I'd say there's a lot of the works on this second floor that bring you into the sort of more desolation space that nature has become um, in the Anthropocene, as you mentioned. I think this, this work really uh, had, has a lot of impact, as well as the Roxy Payne's work, which uh, you might show us as well. Yeah, I mean, this is actually cast from a 2,000-year-old olive tree in Puglia by the artist Ugo Rondinone. And he cast it in aluminium and then covered it with a, a white enamel, which gives it this very ghostly appearance. Mm -hmm. But you know, the shape of this tree, which is incredibly dramatic and twisted and gnarled, is a shape that was sculpted by time. I mean, it's 2000 years of rain and wind. And I think the artist was very interested in that idea of a sculpture that embodies time which of course is something uh, Pannoni was also very interested in. He called a tree, a sculpture that records the, the process of its own making because of the way the tree rings record the growth, the history of growth of a tree. And uh, yes, this is- And in fact, we, we have a question about the Pannoni work. So I think it's nice uh, if you could talk a little bit about um, Pannoni's work and how he's making nature um, reappear. Okay, I mean, on the wall, you can see this drawing of a tree ring-like shape by Pannoni. And in the middle of it is a, a, on a piece of paper is his thumbprint with the whorls of the thumb kind of echoing this tree ring structure. And here is a, is a work which is something he's been making this type of work since the late 1960s, where he takes, uh, in this case, the tree trunk, 
we'll see later on a work he made from an industrial beam. And by tracing the knots and carving around them, he retraces an earlier form of the tree when it was a sapling. So you get a view of the past, uh, you get the shape of the tree at the base of that sapling like structure, you can see the tree rings inside the tree. So a very complex uh, experience of looking at time. Uh, and in this very different work by Roxy Payne, and unfortunately this is a still image because those embers are very nicely done by uh, the artist with a computer controlled light system he came up with. So it looks like they're glowing embers and you can see this fire like glow in the, against the wall that ebbs and, 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 and rises again. And this is, you know, a scene of a, a forest after it's been burnt to the ground. And he's created, he's used a kind of forced perspective to make a tableau of an image that really recorded about a half mile of depth in this uh, forest. And, you know, forest fires are a part of nature, but we're now living in a moment where they've exceeded what's natural. And the fires in California that are still raging in Northern California have just been reclassified. It's no longer a mega fire, it's now called a giga fire. Apparently it's the first giga fire in history, which means over a million acres are burning simultaneously. Um, and of course, a lot of fires these days are not started by lightning, but they're started by uh, man-made conditions. And I think, you know, the artist has said, he, for him, he hopes this just raises that question in your mind. Was it a natural fire? And the fact that we now have this question in our mind and we can't usually answer that question definitively. I mean, we can, when we know that the fire was caused by arson. Um, And this is yes, the other and Pinoni. that's yeah, the other Pinoni. Yes, and this is um, I think when we were talking, uh, as you mentioned that you like the view of this coming down the stairs um, because you experience this first at the ground level when you come in, but then you exit down these front stairs, and so you get to actually look at the top of this sculpture, um, which here it is from the other side. Uh, and it's called Tree of 12 Meters. And uh, if you put the tree on the right on top of the tree on the left, you would get 12 meters. But again, you couldn't fit that in a building. So Benoni <laughs> creates this very interesting thing. And you can look at the base and it's made its own pedestal, but the original wood he was working from was a 12 meter long industrial beam. So a something that's been cut into a perfect rectangular form, um, no longer resembles the shape of a tree. And again, he carved out uh, what the, a younger version of this tree would have been before it was then cut down and, and reshaped into this kind of geometric reductivist industrial form. So again, there's a sense of recuperating from within, you know, our transformation of the tree, this other thing that exists within it. Um, I just want to remind people listening that they can ask a question. So there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen on, on the Zoom. And we've had a, a good one from, from Maya about the Pannoni. Um, we're soon going to come to a close, so I, I, I you know, it's a fascinating exhibition, and I, and I hope it will have whetted people's appetite. And there's going to be a rush to come and see it. Well, within all the restrictions, sadly, that that there are on the visits, um, but um, we think, you know, you've got a knack for picking the right theme at the right time. And we've seen that with the Venice Art Biennale, with this exhibition. So 
my my next question is and um, what are you working on right now so what's gonna what's gonna come in our near future you know it's one of the things about this pandemic is that it's well, there are a lot of, it's had a lot of different effects. I mean, one effect it's had is that people who come to the gallery now have a wonderful experience because only a hundred people can come every hour. And I've also think that people are so hungry to have this experience that they yeah. really look carefully. And of course, if you're a curator, and I think it's the same for an artist, nothing makes you happier than seeing this kind of looking and this sense of discovery and engagement um, but the, one of the bad things for us is that it's basically devastated all of our financial models um, because they're all based on having much larger attendance than we're able to have right now. And these exhibitions are very ex costly to put on. So we're in a moment, as long as we have social distancing, where we actually need to imagine types of exhibitions that we can do, that we can afford to do when we've got smaller audiences. So I had a lot of uh, exhibitions I was dying to do after Venice and they're all gonna be postponed for a couple of years at least. And uh, right now we're actually still working out uh, what some of those replacement shows are gonna be. We will, Funnily enough, the next show we do have uh, is a wonderful show of work by uh, Matthew Barney, which features some absolutely gorgeous sculptures of trees, the first one this artist has ever made, uh, as well as a great film called Redoubt. And we'll be showing at the same time uh, a young South African artist named Ikshan Adams uh, with a new body of work. So. Beyond that, it's still very much, uh, there are works in progress. Um, <laughs> but I'll check in with you in about six months and I'll have an answer to that question. I know, I, I mean, I feel for all art institutions because it's, it's incredibly hard to, to program at a time like this. And uh, the, the financial challenge is huge. So, um, so for anyone who has the opportunity to come and visit the Hayward, I do uh, encourage them and think about supporting, supporting the museums in any way that you can. Um, I'm gonna leave the last question to, um, uh, the audience to Avril, who was who asked whether um, going back to the Among the Tree exhibition, whether there were any artists or specific work that you were not able to include in this remarkable exhibition. Yeah, there were you know dozens. Um, not there was really probably only one painting I was really uh, keen to have in there um, by Albert Erlen, a really beautiful, quite abstract tree painting um, that just wasn't available. And, but the thing is there is so much outstanding work about trees by artists that you could, I could have curated three versions of the show, each one with completely different artists. And I think I've oh, been happy with any one of those versions. Um, and that doesn't always happen when you're doing an exhibition on a particular subject. Um, sometimes you you might feel stretched to, to find enough work. But in this case, uh, you know, I, hopefully there'll be many more tree shows in the future in different places. Uh, I know the Cartier Foundation in Paris did a tree show uh, in the last year also. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot more to discover in, the, in the, this interesting sub-history of the history of art, of art about trees. Well, Thank you so much, Raf, for taking the time to walk us through this exhibition. As you say, it's, uh, it's therapeutic 
And, you know, we've, uh, I've really enjoyed uh, re-seeing, looking again at those beautiful artworks. Um, it's it's uh, an absolutely fantastic show, one that was well deserved to be made. Um, thank you again for, for taking part and, you know, good luck and looking forward to the next show at the Hayward Gallery. Well, thanks. Uh, this was lovely to talk to you tonight, and uh, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>